Hi, my name's Steve Walker. I'm usually called Grandpa, which is what I prefer. I have a book for you today called Jesus the Child. Uh, this is a ladybird book, the text by Jenny Robertson, and the illustrations by Alan Parry. The dinner was cooking. Beans and yellow peas bubbled in the pot. Mary was kneading dough. Suddenly, a voice called her. She looked up, amazed. A stranger stood beside her. Light shone from his face. The Lord is with you, Mary, he said. He is pleased with you. God is giving you a baby boy whose name is to be Jesus. He is the Son of God, the promised King who saves his people. At first, Mary was puzzled. And then she said, I am the Lord's servant maid. I will do whatever he says. Joseph said, People said such unkind things when they heard you would have a baby soon. At first I thought we should not marry. I know, Mary smiled. Then God showed you in a dream what to do. You believed him and married me. Their goats played behind them, and Mary fondled the wriggling kid. Shall we start our journey to Bethlehem before my baby is born, she asked. I'm afraid we must pack our things and set off very soon. The Romans, who rule our country, want everyone to travel to the place where he was born to be registered, counted, and taxed. It will be a hard journey for you. Bethlehem is a long way from our town, Nazareth. God will look after us, Mary reminded her husband. The rocky road wound down the hillside. We're nearly at Bethlehem now, Joseph encouraged Mary. I am so glad, she said. It's nearly night time. We've slept outside so often with only the little fire you light to keep the wild beasts away. It will be much safer to rest in the yard of an inn with other people. I shall be glad to lie down. My baby will be born soon. Then we must hurry on. Do you see how bare the hills are, Joseph said? King David herded his father's sheep here. Our teachers say that Bethlehem, King David's town, will be the place where the promised king will be born. Hurry, little donkey. God is looking after us. The teachers have told the truth. Our baby king will be born tonight in royal Bethlehem. No room, no room, the innkeeper cried. Please, begged Mary, everywhere is full. Can't you help? I wish I could, dear, but... Oh, wait a minute, though. Look, this way. You can sleep in the stable. The straw's clean, and the cows will keep you warm. He turned to Joseph. Hurry, friend, you can lay the baby in the manger. It's soft enough, heaped with hay. So Jesus was born in a stable, because there was no room anywhere else for him in royal Bethlehem. A few days later in a field just outside. News, good news for everyone. The shepherds looked up terrified. Hundreds of shining messengers, brighter than the starlit sky, crowded round them. Don't be afraid, said one. Your promised king, your saviour, has been born. He is close by in Bethlehem, a baby wrapped in linen cloth, lying in a manger. Go quickly and see. Glory, glory to the Most High God. Peace to his people on earth. The shepherds came in. We came as soon as we heard the news. We left our sheep. The Lord God will guard them from harm. Trying to tiptoe, the shepherds crowded into the stable and knelt beside the manger where Jesus slept on the hay. Oh, praise God, thank God. He has sent this little one to be our savior. The promised king is born in a stable, not in a king's great palace. God has not forgotten us, his poor people. Telling everyone the news, the shepherds hurried away while Mary sat and watched her baby boy. It's dark in the stable. The cows low and stamp. Rats run about in the hay. 
but the music of highest heaven pays, plays for you, dear Jesus. Sleep well, little one. Sleep well, Mary said. Wise men came riding towards Bethlehem. Each dry, hot day they rested, shaded by their kneeling camels. At night they rode on following a bright star. The cold wind stung their faces as they gazed at the sky. The star tells me a king is born, and I am old, yet when I saw the star, I left my home and my books to follow it. It must be guiding us towards the royal palace. Surely we shall find the baby there. The star tells me the newborn child is to be a king of wonder who will rule forever. The king, Herod, welcomed the wise men. But their news worried him. A star tells these visitors that a wonderful king is born in my kingdom, Herod thought. Where is this promised king to be born, he asked the priests. In Bethlehem, O king. The priests bowed, hating their ruler, who did not know the promises of God. I must get rid of this baby, Herod decided. I am king in this land. Search for the child in Bethlehem, Herod told the wise men. Tell me where I can find him. I wish to bow before him also, he lied. The wise men found Mary and Jesus in a house in Bethlehem. Here is gold for the king of kings, said one. I have brought sweet-smelling frankincense. I worship God in this small child, another bowed low. Little king... I give you myrrh, for you will heal many hurts, although this will do you harm, said a third. I heard the sound of children crying as we left Bethlehem, Mary said. I heard that sound too, in my sleep last night. God warned me of terrible danger. Herod plans to kill our baby king, Joseph said. He is sure to send his soldiers after us if, we dis if he discovers we have gone. Where shall we be safe, Mary asked. God told me to take you and Jesus far away to another country, to Egypt. We shall make our home there until Herod dies. There are many of our own Jewish people in Egypt. We are sure to find friends. So the little family lived happily in Egypt until it was safe for them to go home to Nazareth. The story of Jesus the child. So my second book is on a completely different subject. It's called A Merry Christmas Mystery and stars Pooh and all his friends. Uh, when I was much, much younger, I was staying with my brother in England, which is quite a long way from here and he lives near the Hundred Acre Wood. And we actually went there and saw where Pooh and his friends live. So this book's called A Merry Christmas Mystery. It's by Betty Burney, illustrated by Nancy Stevenson. It was a very snowy night before Christmas. Winnie the Pooh was so excited he had a hard time getting to sleep. He was thinking about the next day when he and his friends would decorate the great pine tree, then gather round it for their annual Christmas sing-along. When he finally drifted off, Pooh dreamed of all the wonderful honey treats. He was sure that Santa would bring him. The next morning, Pooh raced to his Christmas stocking, but instead of the honey treats he was hoping for, he found a very puzzling present. I wonder why Santa bought me thistles, said Pooh. But they are very nice thistles. I hurt you! Unfortunately, thistles made Pooh sneeze. Pooh tried to get his mind off sneezing by practicing for the sing-along. He sang, Christmas is a time to share, to show your friends how much you care. Achoo! He sneezed again. A smackerel of honey will cure my sneezing, Pooh decided. But when he went to the cupboard, all the jars were empty. Maybe Piglet will bring some honey when he stops by, Pooh thought hopefully. 
Just then, there was a knock at the door. Pooh opened it and was startled by what he saw. Standing there was a mysterious creature with long orange fur and a la large round head. Don't be scared, Pooh. It's me, Piglet, his small friend announced. Santa brought me this coat for Christmas. It's a bit big, but it should keep me warm when we decorate the tree. It wouldn't happen to have any honey in the pockets, would it? Pooh asked. Piglet checked. There was no honey, only the acorn ornaments he had made. That reminds me, said Pooh, I have to take along my decoration for the great pine tree. Pooh took the chain of golden honey pots from the Christmas tree. Then he and Piglet rushed through the frosty white forest to meet their friends. Oops, said Piglet, as he tripped over his long coat. Oh, bother, said Pooh. I guess Santa forgot your size. When they arrived at the great pine tree, Pooh wished Eeyore a Merry Christmas. How do you like the thistles, Santa? Ah, two bought me, Pooh asked. Oh, they're Beautiful, Eeyore answered wistfully, as beautiful as this coat rack Santa brought me. Rabbit stepped forward. That's not a coat rack, Eeyore. It's a very fine rake. Pooh noticed that Rabbit was wearing a tiny pair of earmuffs. Santa brought them, Rabbit explained. And I got this tigerific jar of honey, said Tigger. Pooh held his empty tummy and asked, Does it taste good? How would I know? Tiggers hate honey, his bouncy friend replied. But it was nice of Santa to think of me. Santa bought me something to eat too, said Roo, showing his friends a jar of crunchy cookies. Do they have any honey in them? Pooh asked hopefully. No, Roo said. They're made of birdseed. They taste terrible. But Santa was nice to bring them. Santa sure left some very puzzling presents, said Piglet. It's a mystery, said Pooh, but I like mysteries. Well then, said Rabbit, here's another mystery for you. Where is Owl? He's late, Piglet said. This is mysterious, Pooh agreed. Owl is never late. The friends decided to go ahead and start decorating the great pine tree, because Owl's part in the ceremony always came last. After they finished hanging their ornaments, they waited for Owl. And then they waited, and waited, and waited some more. I'm cold, moaned Tigger, and I'm hungry, groaned P Pooh. Oh, here, have some honey, t said Tigger. Pooh gratefully accepted. If you're cold, Tigger, please take this coat, Piglet said. Gee, it fits perfectly, exclaimed Tigger. And I bet these earmuffs would keep your ears warmer than mine, said Rabbit, placing the fuzzy earmuffs on Roo's ears. Pooh was halfway through the pot of honey when he noticed Eeyore looking longingly at his thistles. Would you like them, Eeyore? Thanks for noticing me, said Eeyore, accepting his favorite treats. I don't suppose anybody could use this coat rack, uh, I mean rake. Rabbit eagerly reached out for the tool. Thank you, Eeyore, he said. It's just what I wanted. Roo looked down at the jar of birdseed cookies. If anyone would like these cookies, I'd be happy to share them, he said. Oh, thank you, Roo, said Owl, swooping down from the tree. He took a bite of one of the cookies and declared it to be delicious. And then he said, Sorry I'm late, but I got lost on my way here. Owl's friends wondered how he could get lost in the hundred-acre wood. I'll show you, said Owl. He led them a short distance to a road sign. Here's the problem, said Owl. These arrows are all mixed up, so I ended going in the wrong direction. The friends studied the signpost carefully. Sure enough, the arrow that should have been pointing to Owl's house was turned so it pointed at Eeyore's house, and the arrow for Eeyore's house was pointed to Pooh's house. In fact, all of the arrows were pointing the wrong way. The signpost must have gotten turned around in the snowstorm, said Rabbit. 
Pooh scratched his head thoughtfully. I think we've just solved our mystery. That's right, said Piglet. I bet Santa got confused and delivered our presents to the wrong houses. Do you mean these mittens aren't really for me? Owl asked, pointing to a small pair of purple mittens hanging from a string round his neck. No, Owl, these birdseed cookies are for you, said Pooh. Now think, think, think. Who could these mittens be meant for? Piglet gently cleared his throat. <clears> throat> Owl smiled and handed the mittens to Piglet. Of course, Piglet, they'll fit you much better. After they straightened the sign, the friends returned to the great pine tree. Soon Kanga arrived with hot chocolate and cakes and honey as she did every year, and Christopher Robin brought a beautiful shiny star as he did every year. I was hoping you'd come, said Pooh. I always do, Christopher Robin reminded him. Owl flew the shiny star to the top of the tree as he did every year. Then, as the soft snow began to fall, the friends joined hands and sang, Christmas is a time to share, to show your friends how much you care. Whether they are big or small, friends are the very best gifts of all. When the song was finished, Tigger said, I hope Santa brings us some more puzzling presents next year so we can swap them again. Yes, it's nice to have a mystery for Christmas, Pooh explained, as long as there's honey to go with it. Christopher Robin chuckled and said, Silly old bear. Then he bent down and gave Pooh a special Christmas hug. Hi, I'm Jamie. I have a couple of Christmas books for you today. The first one is recommended by my granddaughter, Enda. She likes to read this one with her dad, whose name is Jamie as well. It's called The Christmas Trolls, and it was written by Jan Brett. I'm Trevor, and the day my brother Sammy and I went to our neighbor's farm to pick out a Christmas tree was the beginning of the most unforgettable Christmas I ever had. As we went home through the forest with a perfect tree packed on the sleigh, Tuffy started sniffing and barking. I couldn't see anything, but I felt sure someone was watching us. When we arrived home, we forgot all about the forest. Mom and Dad had brought our boxes of ornaments to decorate the tree. Sammy and I put up evergreen wreaths, mistletoe, and holly all around the house. We had already wrapped our presents and hidden them away for Christmas morning. Then, some of our Christmas decorations started to disappear. I didn't notice until Dad asked if we had moved the trinket box he had hidden for Mom. I shivered because Mom had just asked me the same thing about the mittens she had knitted for Dad. Sammy and I looked in all the usual hiding places, but we couldn't find them. Tuffy was acting strange, too. He sniffed and barked and ran around in circles as if he were looking for something. Then, a few days before Christmas, the treetop angel was gone. What would be next? I started carrying my favorite red horse everywhere. Early the next morning, when I went to feed Arnie, I saw something flying across the snow. It was our Christmas pudding. I harnessed Arnie, bells and all, and raced after it into the forest. As I got closer, I could see that our pudding was being carried along, pin-cushioned on the top of a hedgehog. I didn't know what to do, so I yelled, Stop! Come back! But it didn't stop until it reached the bottom of four fir trees. The hedgehog put the pudding down and scampered off. Just then, the trees started rocking back and forth. Suddenly, a funny-looking ladder dropped down from above, and two trolls scurried down, pouncing on the pudding before I could even move. They pulled it back and forth as they went up the ladder, squabbling all the way to the top. I climbed right up after them, 
and looked inside. There on the floor of their troll house were all of our Christmas things in a heap. The trolls were grabbing at them, each one wanting what the other one had. Hey trolls, I called, those are our Christmas things. The trolls dove into the pile, clutching our gifts. Mine, they clamored, mine, mine. I looked at them and I had to smile. Their shirt tails were hanging out, their pants were torn and patched, their cheeks were bright and red, and their hair was standing up straight from all the pulling and tugging at each other. Christmas, they wailed, we want Christmas. You want Christmas, I asked, puzzled. Yes, they shouted, give us Christmas. Well, you can't just take Christmas, I said. The trolls looked surprised. They squeaked, they gulped, they shoveled their feet. Want Christmas, they said, sounding miserable. Okay, you can have Christmas, but first, what are your names? Mig, said one. Tig, said the other. I looked around the messy hut. Mig, Tig, let's begin by getting your house ready for Christmas. I started to straighten up and put things away, and they began to help. Nice, I said, when we were finished. Now let's make your house look like Christmas. We went outside and gathered evergreens, berries, and pine cones. Now we need a Christmas tree, I told them. That's easy, you live in the trees, so you can have four trees instead of just one if you want to. Christmas trees, they shouted, jumping up and down, and we decorated each of the trees that held up their troll house. Tig and Meg had a small setback on the way back to the hut. I knew I had some more explaining to do. When I first got here, you were snatching things for yourselves and acting really grumpy. Try playing together and having some fun. Fun, they asked. I showed them how to jump rope. I told them how much I liked their tail knots and the earrings and they smiled shyly and started tucking in their shirt tails. Nice hair, pretty belt, they said, grinning at me, and they taught me a little troll dance. They were catching on. Now, if you really want Christmas, you must be generous with each other. If you do that, you'll have Christmas right here in your troll house. The trolls cocked their heads and squinted. They were trying hard to understand. How, they pleaded, I felt my red horse in my pocket. I knew I had to show them, so I took it out and I gave it to them. This is for you. The trolls squealed and jumped up and down with glee. They took turns passing my horse back and forth, happily playing with it together. It was time for me to go home. I slipped out quietly and climbed down to Arnie. And to my surprise, their hedgehog had packed all of our presents on the sleigh for me to take home while we were having Christmas in the troll house. On Christmas morning, Sammy and I ran downstairs to find our tree lit with candles and our stockings filled. We opened our presents in front of the fire. But this Christmas was full of surprises. I heard a bumping and a scratching noise, and Tuffy barked. I listened and followed the sounds. Outside on the doorstep was a Christmas present. I unwrapped it and found a wild and wonderful troll horse. Tig and Mig, I exclaimed. And when I held it, I knew for sure that the trolls understood Christmas, and I knew that this was the best Christmas ever. Hope you enjoyed that one. I have another one. This one is written by Tommy DePaola. It's called Jingle the Christmas Clown. Oom papa, oom papa, rat a tat, rat a tat, rat a tat, oom papa, oom papa, tiddly 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 dee. Tiddly, tiddly, diddly, dee, oom papa, oom papa. Nothing sounded happier to jingle than the music of the band filling the air as Il Circo Piccolo, the little circus, traveled across the countryside. Jingle rode with the baby animals. The older clown said that he was still too young and too small to perform with them, 
so it was Jingle's job to take care of the babies. Frick, frack, smick and smack, he be still, he called to the baby monkeys who were jumping back and forth between Sparkle the Pony and Peter the Donkey. The baby elephant's trunk drooped. Don't worry, Lolly, we'll be there soon, and then you can rest. Every year, Il Circo Piccolo stopped at the same village before going on to the big city, where it performed from the day after Natale, which is Christmas, until Capodanno, which is New Year's Day. On the Vigilia di Natale, Christmas Eve, there would be a special show for the village. It was Jingle's favorite night. All the villagers, young and old, laughed and clapped and cheered. There's the village, the, the impresario shouted out. It looks different, said Madame Sophie, the bareback rider. There's no smoke coming out of the chimneys. Everything looks closed up, said Rollo, the tightrope walker. A cold gust of wind blew across the hills, and the aerialist family shivered. Where is everybody? they asked. As the circus troupe looked on, a small group of people climbed up the hill to meet them. Buongiorno, Signor Mayor, greeted the impresario. Il Circo Pacolo is here once again, ready to perform on Christmas Eve. Ah, impresario, the mayor said, puffing from the climb. I have sad news. I'm afraid there'll be no circus this year. Too much rain in the spring and hot, dry summer have ruined our crops, and many families have left our village. There is hardly anyone here. Our little mill has stopped. The miller's wife said, my husband had to go to another town to look for work. Only when Fichetti, old timers are left, Pietro the barber told him. Most of our shops have closed. Even the church is closed, said Signora Lena, who used to clean the priest's house. We have to go all the way to the next town for the Holy Mass. So we won't be celebrating, Christ celebrating Christmas here this year, as the mayor added. And we certainly can't afford the circus either. We're sorry, everyone. This is terrible, the impresario said. What shall we do, asked the clowns, Toto and Clippo. Let's keep going to the city, said Il Moscolo, the strong man. If we hurry, we can get the tents up and do a Christmas Eve performance there. Yes, yes, you're right, the impresario agreed. Let's get moving, everyone. Arrivederci, my friends. We're sorry for your troubles, and we hope that next year things will be better for you. Impresario, sir, a small voice said. It was Jingle. What is it, Jingle? the impresario asked. The baby animals, senor. They are too tired and too small to go all that way now. We have been traveling all day. Can't we rest here tonight and go tomorrow? If we wait, we'll lose too much time. Il Muscolo complained. Let Jingle stay here with the babies. We can come back for them after the Christmas Eve performance, Madame Sophie suggested. It's only the day after tomorrow, said Toto and Clippo. Will you be all right, Jingle? The impresario asked, and the little clown nodded sadly. Jingle, you can set up your tent by my barn, offered Donna Chiara. Every winter she let the circus stay in her fields. We will help, some of the old people said. A small tent shouldn't be too hard. So it was decided. Il Circo Piccolo would move on, and Jingle and the baby animals would stay behind. Jingle watched as the wagons rode away. Poor Jingle, poor baby animals. They all tried not to cry. It's In no time, a small tent was pitched for Jingle and the babies, and their wagon was parked nearby. Jingle got food and water for them all. Donna Chiera came out to them. Well, bambini mie, my children, she said. I'm sorry that you have to be here in our sad little village, especially with Christmas coming. Nobody young, not even baby animals should be without Christmas. But what about you and all the others, Jingle asked. Won't you miss Christmas? We old folks have had many Christmases before, Donna Chiera said with a smile and the priest is coming on Christmas Day to celebrate the Holy Mass. But I will miss our Mass on the Vigilia di Natale, she said, sadly. 
and everyone will miss the family feast that night. And the Staline Doro are special cookies that look like golden stars. But we have our memories, so it won't be too bad. Well, buona notte, picky. Good night, my little ones, Donna Chiara said. And she went into her home. Now, Jingle began to feel sorrier for the villagers than for himself and the baby animals. It's so sad, babies, Jingle said to the animals. I can't even imagine no Christmas. I wish there was something we could do for our friends. The baby animals gathered around him. Offer and Browsy, the puppies, hopped up onto Jingle's lap. Rana, the tiger cub, and Simbo, the lion cub, snuggled next to him. Even Frick, Frack, Smick, and Smack stopped chasing each other around and looked at Jingle. Suddenly, Offer and Bowsy jumped down and began to dance around like the big dogs. While we stood on our hind legs, while the cubs swatted their paws like the big cats. That's it, Jingle cried. We will put on a circus of our own for the village. We have all day tomorrow to get ready. We'll make like a Christmas for this town. Everyone sit still now and let me think. Early the next morning, Jingle went to the village and he put up a sign. The mayor came out of his house. Oh, Piccolo Pigulaco, little clown, the mayor said. You are kind, but we can't have a circus this year. We are too poor. But, Senor Mayor, it says it's free, Senor Lina said. But it also says in the town square, and it's starting to snow, Pietro pointed out. You will be able to perform here tonight. It will be all right. I know it will, Jingle said. Please come. Ah, Jingle, Donna Chiara said when Jingle told her what he and the animals were going to do. You have such a big heart, caro mio. I shall help too. I can sew your costumes. Donna Chiara sat and sewed while Jingle rehearsed with the baby animals. Outside, the snow fell all day long. I know it will be all right, Jingle kept telling himself. I know in my heart we mustn't give up. Now, once more... It's time, everyone, Jingle stepped out of the tent. The night took his breath away. The snow had stopped, and the stone streets sparkled with white. Stars looking like diamonds, flung up by a giant hand, twinkled in the deep blue velvet sky. Donna Chiara walked to the town square with Jingle and his troop. Wally swept away the snow in, bi in a big circle. Sparkle and Peta packed it down with their hooves. The monkeys climbed all over the place, putting up ropes. Time to put on our costumes, Jingle called. Next, he took the instruments out of the trunk and gave them to the monkeys. Then the little troop marched around the square, banging the drums and tooting the horns. Donna Chiara knocked on the doors and shutters. Slowly, one after another, shutters opened and then doors. The villagers came out of their houses and Jingle's circus began. Offer and Bowsy jumped on and off Sparkle and Peta as they trotted around. Lolly danced, Simbo and Rana jumped through hoops, the monkey swung on ropes and trapezes, and Jingle tumbled better than he had ever tumbled before. The audience clapped and cheered. And now, friends, our finale, Jingle announced proudly. The baby animals formed a pyramid. Jingle gave each of them a candle. There, in the middle of the square, stood a living Christmas tree. One by one, the villagers went into their houses and put lighted candles in their windows. Look, look, the old people whispered and pointed to the pyramid. The Christmas angel had appeared on top of the living Christmas tree. The angel opened its hands and golden stars fluttered down. Bon Natale, the angel sang. Bon Natale, Merry Christmas the villagers sang back. And when they looked at Jingle and the baby animals to thank them for their gift of Christmas, there, shining over Jingle's head, was one of the golden stars. And that was it. They made a nice Christmas in the little village. 
Hope you enjoy your Christmas. And until next time, thanks. Hello everybody, how are you? Happy Holidays! It is our Holiday Read Aloud this week and I have two what I think are fun books. You may or may not disagree. Do you have anything fun planned for the holidays? Are your family doing anything different than some of your friends are doing? Something unique? We call those family traditions. I hope you have some great family traditions coming your way up soon. So my first book that I'm going to read today is called Dear Santa. I know it looks bad, but it wasn't my fault. And that's by Norma Lewis, illustrated by Olivia Beckman. So remember, that means, that means Norma wrote the words and Olivia drew all the pictures. You ready? Dear Santa, I know it looks bad, but it wasn't my fault. This book is about a cat named Scallywag. All right, so it's written like a journal. It's got dates and he's telling his little story of his day. December 15th, Dear Santa, I've been an outstanding cat all year. I was never a picky eater. I tried every new food in front of me. Look at him eating those donuts. <laughs> I always finished my dinner, his dinner of chips. And I only ate Miss Violet's cake once. Should cats be eating cake? Sometimes I played too rough with our canary, Caruso, but he usually started it. Okay, so about my Christmas gift. I don't want to sound ungrateful, but a cat can have too many catnip mice. Look at all those catnip mice. Does it look like Scalawag is very happy about it? Doesn't to me. I like cat catnip as much as anyone, but every year, Miss Violet helps me open my present and waits for me to act like a total doofus over a box of pink mice. It's hard to hold on to my dignity. So this year, May I instead have a Catman and Robin video game? The one where they break up the catnip smuggling ring sounds perfect. Your friend, Scalawag. Can you imagine a cat wanting to play a video game named Catman and Robin instead of Batman and Robin? Get it? December 16th. Dear Santa, you might hear a different story, but this is what really happened and it wasn't my fault. Miss Violet let Caruso out of his cage while she was cleaning it. He flew onto my tail and I called him a bird brain. He is a bird, isn't he? So I grabbed him. What's wrong with that? I would never eat him. I'd much rather have tuna than a yucky canary. Who wants a mouthful of feathers? Not me. Do you think he would eat Caruso? Look at him, look at him, him like that. Caruso was flying around the room when Miss Violet's friend Mitzi dropped in. She spotted a canary feather on my chin and hollered, Scalawag ate Caruso! I scooted outside because Mitzi screeching made my head hurt. Remember, I didn't leave the door open. Mitzi did. Sounds like Scalawag is blaming Mitzi. Now I know now that the new thing next door is a sandbox for kids. But it looked like a litter box for cats. Just my luck. I got caught using it. Do you know what that means? That means Scalawag snuck out of the house and got caught going to the bathroom in the kid's sandbox. Ew! Can you imagine that? So gross. That neighbor does not look happy. Before I knew it, the neighbor had me by the scruff of the neck. Of course he tattled. Caruso was back in his cage by then. He smirked at me and then went back to admiring himself in the mirror. Some fat folks think cats have an attitude. We don't hold a can candle to canaries. Don't forget my video game. Your friend, Scalawag. December 17th. This is the third day in a row. Dear Santa, something terrible happened today, but it wasn't my fault. I was helping Miss Violet, honest. She left a little milk in the pitcher, so I cleaned it out for her. When I was done, no. Do you see what Scalawag is doing to clean out the pitcher? At first he starts drinking it, then he climbs inside the pitcher. What do you think is going to happen to Scalawag? So you ready? When I was done, I was stuck. Look at that pitcher stuck on his head like that. If you've ever gotten stuck in something, you know I'm the victim here. Caruso squawked until Miss Violet came. She grabbed me up, pitcher and all, and ran out the door. A police, off police officer saw her running and gave us a ride. That was cool, except for the picture. Got to ride in a cop car to the vet. Dr. Tim, our vet, is okay, but Mitzi works in his office. She gave me a dirty look. I didn't get stuck on purpose. I was helping Miss Violet. He feels like he was helping Miss Violet clean the inside of the, what, the milk pitcher. Have you ever done something like that, where you said you were helping and maybe it wasn't as helpful as you thought it was going to be? 
They put me on a metal table, it was cold, and gave me a shot. Dr. Sin Tim said it would help me relax. You try relaxing with a needle in your rump and a pitcher on your head. Doesn't sound very fun to me. Dr. Tin greased up my neck with something goopy. The pitcher slipped right off. Phew, but then things got worse. Look at, they gave Scalawag a bath. Do you know any cats who like to take a bath and then get their hair blown dry by a hair dryer? I know I have two cats and I think they would run away if I tried to do that to them. Finally, we could leave. Of all the cats in the world, how did you get stuck with him? Mitzi asked Violet. Just lucky, I guess, Miss Violet said. What a nice woman Miss Violet is. After all that, don't you think I deserve a Catman and Robin video game? Your friend, Scalawag. December 18th, Dear Santa, I know it looks bad, but it wasn't my fault. Even outstanding cats have bad days. And today was a doozy. Miss Violet never once got angry with me about the pitcher or the sandbox, so I wanted to make her happy and put on a show. I found a red mouse, remember? I have plenty. I batted it, I rolled with it, I chewed on it, and then I batted it again. Miss Violet laughed herself silly. Even Mitzi smiled. It was worth losing a little bit of my dignity. We get along great, Miss Violet and me, and I would never want her to get hurt. I batted the mouse a little too hard. That might be how it got in the tree. Of course I went after it. I'm a cat. Scalawag's climbing the tree, yelled Mitzi. Tattletail. The tree wobbled. Miss Violet reached out to catch me. Crash! Candy canes flew, ornaments fell, glass shattered, the tree tipped over and onto Miss Violet. But Santa, she was only unconscious for a minute. Honest. Oh my gosh. Look at that. The tree fell on Miss Violet. How do you think Scalawag felt about that? How do you think Mitzi felt about Scalawag? She definitely does not love that cat, does she? And about the candle. I'm not sure who bumped the table. It might have been me. The fire never spread behind the tablecloth, except for scorching the table in a tiny hole in the rug, honest. Did I tell you the smoke detector went off? So when the cat knocked over the tree, he also knocked over a candle and started a fire in the house. Can you believe this? This sounds like a really bad day. I think Scalawag was right. This was a doozy of a day. The cat did it, Mitzi told the firefighters when the firefighters came. The cat did it, the firefighters told the paramedics. The paramedics are the people who come to help people who are hurt or sick. Get rid of that cat, they all said. Look at Mitzi with a bandage on her head. Seems like no one likes Scalawag except Mitzi, I mean Miss Violet. Yes, Scalawag has to go, said Mitzi. Nonsense, said Violet. Since Scalawag moved in, I have fun, I laugh. He warms my feet all night and keeps me company all day. If that's not a good cat, what is? Of course he's mischievous. I named him Scalawag, didn't I? If I wanted a boring cat, I'd have named him Fred. I purred. Wasn't that so nice of Miss Violet to stand up for Scalawag? December 24th. Dear Santa, please don't bring me a Catman and Robin video game or anything else. Instead, please bring Miss Violet new Christmas tree ornaments. Did I mention that hers are broken? She loves the ones that look like nutcrackers. Your friend, Scalawag. Wasn't that nice of Scalawag? Now, instead of asking for a presence for him and trying to explain away all his bad behavior, you would never do that, right? He's asking to replace the ornaments for Miss Violet. Don't you like that one? We thought that was cute in my house. I hope you guys liked it. Now, the second book I have to read is a new one. I had never seen this one. I just found it this year. It's called How the Grinch Lost Christmas not how he stole Christmas. So this is the continuation of the story. It's the following Christmas. You ready? By Dr. Seuss. Let's see how this plays out. Do you think the Grinch is still good? I hope so. Dr. Seuss's How the Grinch Lost Christmas. Up on Mount Crouton, <laughs> I was practicing this and I just messed it up, ready? Up on Mount Crumpet, just north of the Who's, a Who just delivered the day's, the day's Whoville news. The cave among Crumpet was home to the Grinch, who sprung from his cave just enough, plus one inch, to stare down at Whoville from high up above it. Tomorrow was Christmas, and speaking there of it, my heart, grinned the Grinch, has grown quite to love it. The Grinch had been patiently waiting all year to celebrate Christmas and bring the Who's cheer. To show every Who who he was different now, I've changed, thought the Grinch, and I'll prove it. But how? Look at he wants to prove how nice he is now. 
While eating his breakfast of hoo hash on rye, the newspaper there and the chair caught his eye. A contest in Whoville tomorrow at three to see who can make the most Christmassy tree. Then he got an idea, a crafty idea. The Grinch got an awfully crafty idea. I wonder what the Grinch is gonna do. There's a contest to see who can make the most Christmassy Christmas tree? Sounds interesting. He laughed in his throat, I know just what to do. Then the Grinch grabbed his pencil and drew, 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 drew. With a plan in his hand, the Grinch hiked the Who Wood, where he found the most Christmas Christmassy tree that he could. And he chopped at that tree with his tree chopping ax till the tree he was chopping fell down next to Max. Remember Max, his dog? Still here. Then they hiked their way home with their tree on their backs. Our cellar has all of the things we will use to start decorating our tree for the Who's. Grab ribbons, he shouted, grab bunches of bows, grab plenty of these and a big pile of those. Bring everything reddish and everything greenish and every last colorful thing in betweenish. Look at all these ornaments. Who would have ever guessed that the Grinch has all these ornaments? I'll win, 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 he was grinchously humming. Then all of a sudden he heard someone coming. Now who could that be, said the Grinch with a sneer, and he turned around fast, and then who should appear? Who do you think it was? Right there in the hallway stood Cindy Lou Who, right? Don't we all love Cindy? She's so sweet. The sweetest of all of the Who's that he knew. Hello, she exclaimed, I have something to ask. I do hope it isn't a bothersome task. I've come here to ask a small favor, you see, and if you have time, could you make one for me? The Grinch interrupted her tiny request. My dear, he replied, it would really be best to ask me tomorrow on Christmas, you see. Right now, I must finish my prize-winning tree. Perhaps I can help you, sweet Cindy Lou said, but the Grinch simply patted the who on her head. Then he shooed her outside and replied, don't be silly. Do run along home now before it gets chilly. Throughout the whole day and late into the night, he worked on that tree till the tree was just right. Look at all the ornaments. Look at how pretty his tree looks. I've done it, he shouted. It's perfectly grand. I hope that it shows every who in the land what wonderful Christmassy spirit I found. I knew in my heart I am sure to be crowned. He thinks he's going to win. That's how proud he is of this tree. At quarter past, past dawn with the sun rising fast, the Who's were awake, it was Christmas at last. The bells around Whoville were ringing and dinging. The Who's down in Whoville were merrily singing. The Grinch ran outside and yelled, Christmas is here, at the sound of that ringing and sing-along cheer. And when the time came for the Grinch to depart, he loaded the sleigh and took off like a dart, sledding down, 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 down to the town, Whoville Town Square. Contestants, the Grinch heard the mayor declare, it's time for the judges to judge all your trees. The rest of you Who's, have a seat, if you please. Look at all these trees. Look at how different they look. Some are big, some are small, some are fat trees, some are skinny trees. I love it. The trees were lined up from tallest to smallest. The Grinch's tall tree was the tallest of allest. So look how big his tree is in comparison to everybody else's. And down at the end to the far, far, far right was Cindy Lou Who's with its much smaller height. Do you see Cindy all the way there in the corner? Look how little her tree is, but it looks so sweet, doesn't it? When their mayor announced who had taken third place, the Grinch felt his Christmas-filled heart start to race. And now, the mayor said, without further ado, the lucky contestant who placed number two lives high on Mount Crumpet. We're thrilled that he's here. The Grinch wins the second place trophy this year. So the Grinch got second place. Good for him. Don't you think he'll be so excited? He's not. The Grinch felt a shock as his heart turned ice cold. He felt it start shrinking, and it, so it is told that there in the square, all the who's who were near it are certain they saw it and sure they could hear it. They could hear his heart shrinking and getting cold again. Remember in the first book, his heart grew three sizes that day. Uh-oh. The moment the Grist lost his Christmassy spirit, his arms started itching, his legs started twitching. Then both of his eyes started twitching and itching. And that Christmas-filled heart, well, it shrank, shrank, shrunk down. I've been robbed, the Grinch snarled. I am through with this town. The Grinch stuffed his tree in his ramsackle shay. Then he lugged it and tugged it and hauled it away. As, he, as Max tried his hardest to get him to stay, the Who's were all speechless, unsure what to say. Look at that. The Grinch was mad, so he took his tree and left. That doesn't sound very nice, does it? The Grinch climbed and climbed as his heart grew more frozen. Well, back at the contest, a winner was chosen. 
Today on the merriest day in the land, the mayor declared with his hoo horn in hand, I give you our winner, she's not more than three. It's Cindy Lou Who, who has made the best tree. The Who girl had asked every Who there that day to make her an ornament she could display to celebrate Whoville and everyone in it. She entered the contest, not thinking she'd win it. So Cindy Lou Who asked everyone in town to make her an ornament to hang on her tree. That's what she was asking the Grinch for when she came up to see him. Wasn't that so nice of her? The Grinch heard the mayor from high on the peak when then Cindy Lou Who grabbed the Who horn to speak. I wanted to make all of a Who Who Villa tree with ornaments each of you Who's made for me. But there's one ornament missing, you see. The whole town of Whoville was there on each limb, except for the Grinch, so she called out to him. Now please, Mr. Grinch, I saved you a spot. You're someone we Who's like an awfully lot. This tree is for Whoville and you're part of it too. I hope you can hear me, said Cindy Lou Who. Wasn't that so nice? She wants him to come back and join their celebration. She's telling them how much everybody in the town loves him. He doesn't feel very loved right now, does he? Cindy Lou's voice stopped the Grinch in his tracks. He looked down at Whoville, then looked down at Max. I thought, the Grinch puzzled, a prize-winning tree would prove to the Who's what today means to me and show them for certain I truly belonged. But perhaps I was wrong and belonged all along? And maybe, just maybe, we all win instead by being together at Christmas, he said. Sounds like he's starting to understand what Christmas is, right? That everybody wins if you're with the people you care about. And then I'm on Crumpet. If you, had to, if you had been near it, you would have been able to see it and hear it. The moment his heart grew a few more sizes more to more than his heart had grown ever before. So his heart got even bigger than the last book. This is so exciting. And what happened then? Well, in Whoville, they say, that Grinch and his dog was back down on that sleigh. And the Grinch placed his ornament on the small tree, and he lifted it high so the whole town could see. The Who's all hooray, and they jumped to their feet as the Grinch grinned and said, now our tree is complete. Then the mayor declared, we have one thing to do to make it official for Cindy Lou Who. Would you do the honors, he pointed and said. And the Grinch, he himself, placed the crown on her head. So look at that. Now the Grinch is crowning Cindy Lou the winner of the Christmas tree contest. And they all look so happy. What do you think of that version? Did you think that that was how Christmas was going to be the next year for the Grinch? I like it. I like that he's still a little bit curmudgeonly, but much more involved in the community. Well, I hope you liked my books. I hope you have a wonderful holiday, however you celebrate it. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.